All right, how's it going everybody? We are here on Friday, February 5th, and today we're gonna to talk about section 1.9, changing variables and linearization. Um, this is our last section in chapter one. Um, if you're looking above my head right here, then you can see next week we're going to get into introduction to systems of different systems of differential equations, right? So this is our last day of dealing with uh, single individual differential equations. And for, I mean, really the, the biggest chunk of our semester, we're actually going to be spending our time looking at systems of two differential equations that are interacting with one another, like a dx dt and a dy dt, where y and x both influence each other like our rabbit and fox populations will be like sort of our cliche first example there um, and so just kind of like where we're headed right now this is our wrap up to our um, single first order ordinary differential equations um, next week we're going to introduce our systems um, chapter two is quite a bit shorter than chapter one chapter two we're only covering sections two one two two and two three Section 2.4 is our numerical solutions to systems, which is supposed to sort of be like a partner with section 1.4 that we skipped. Those are our programming sections. So next week, we're going to cover 2.1 and 2.2. The week after that, we're going to just do section 2.3, and then we're going to start our like little Python programming unit, which will last for that week, and then the week after that as well. Um, so that'll where our numerical solutions are coming. So we're basically doing chapter 1, chapter 2, taking a break from following the book ordering of things and doing our numerical programming unit for like a week and a half, two weeks, and then we'll pick it back up with chapter three so that we can use our, our numerical, uh, like a bunch of our results from the numerical stuff, from our programming stuff to help us out with a bunch of the chapter three content. And chapter three is sort of the, um, it's the meatiest chapter, I think, uh, of this class right here. It's kind of, a, it's going to take a lot of it's, it's not too hard, but man, it's going to take like a lot of like work to get through the chapter three stuff right there, but a ton of really cool stuff that we'll see in there. Um, so that's kind of where we're headed right now. So today we are wrapping up chapter one. So change of variables and linearization. So far where we're at is we can analytically solve, meaning we can come up with a uh, explicit solution for Y if we, or okay, maybe an implicit solution for Y, but we can do the calculus if it is separable or if it's linear, right? Those are the two scenarios we covered. Separable was section 1.2, linear was last video, section 1.8. The other thing that we've seen is that even if we can't actually like do the solving, at least if the equation is autonomous, meaning that there's no dependence of T in the differential equation expression, and if it's a first order ordinary differential equation, then we can graphically analyze those guys. We can look at things like phase lines and stuff like that. And as we've kind of seen, you know, we're, we're covering nine sections in this chapter. Only two of them were giving us techniques to actually solve differential equations. And that's very much broadly the theme of this, not just this class, but the this entire branch of mathematics is we need to have ways to analyze differential equations that aren't dependent on our ability to find a solution, you know, our ability to like integrate and do stuff like that. So these uh, more generic analysis techniques of saying, well, can we at least graph what we think the solutions look like? It's really meaningful stuff right there. So this is kind of where we're at. These are sort of like the three things that we can do to help ourselves analyze differential equations. Solve it if it's separable, solve it if it's linear, or graphically analyze it if it's autonomous, right? So, um, Kind of where we're headed with today then is what we know from calculus two is that integration is fickle right all it takes is a little wobble to your expression and you can no longer perform the integration out there um, and so often what we're interested in doing is algebraically simplifying our integrands and our general calculus expressions of interest uh, as much as possible to make them more manageable for us the, the first way that you ever learn to do this, this is like week one of calculus two, is you learn U substitution, right? And that's where we see things like integrals that look like this, where you don't know an antiderivative for it directly. And then we say things like, oh, but if you let U be X squared, and then we have DU is two DX or two X DX, then it looks like we can just rewrite this integral, just the integral of e to the u, and we've got found our way to a solution there, right? So u sub is a way for us to algebraically simplify the expressions of interest so that we then are able to perform the calculus operations of interest. So that's kind of what we're gonna do today. I, I like to think of today as sort of the differential equations version of u sub. It's gonna work mechanically pretty much the same way as how u sub worked. Um, what our issue is going to be is the substitutions that we're going to make are going to be a little bit less obvious, right? When we do U sub, we do things like say, oh, U sub is good for 
composition of functions. It's sort of our way of undoing the chain rule. So we always look for expressions like an x squared and their derivative, 2x. And then that's our big green flag that says, yep, go ahead with u sub right there. What we're going to see in this setting is that while the mechanics are going to be kind of similar, our motivation is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit tougher for us to judge. How do we know what modifications we should be making um, to, to enable us to finally analyze the difficult differential equation? Just like this. This is a difficult integrand turned into a not difficult integrand right there by performing a correct substitution. I say correct, a smart substitution. Um, so we want to look for those today. So that'll be kind of one of our things here. So what I'm going to kind of say to you is we're going to start by doing what I'm going to refer to as an unmotivated example, meaning I'm basically just going to tell you what substitution we should do. It's not a super obvious one. I wouldn't necessarily expect that you would see the steps for this one right here, but I do expect that you can follow the mechanics of the steps. For our other examples that we'll do today, the whole point of those will be to say things like, well, how did I know that I should make that particular substitution? So for the first one, you shouldn't know how which substitution to choose. But if I were to tell you, hey, do this substitution right there, you could certainly follow the math through to get to a, an end result. But the kind of the point here is we care a lot about strategy, not just our ability to do, but our ability to think and strategize. So I'm kind of trying to separate those with these with the, the first couple problems that we're seeing right here. So our first differential equation to look at is this dy dt equals negative y over t plus t minus 1 over 2y. And here's the things that I'm seeing kind of right away. It's not autonomous. Right, it's got t stuff. So I can't do things like uh, make my general claims about our graphs. I know that if t is involved, then we might have intersections of solutions and stuff, right? That fly could be going different directions at, depending on different times. If it's right in front of my face at the same location, but at different times, it could go different directions at different times. So we, we lose our ability to make broad graphical judgments about what our solutions might look like here. Our ability to draw phase lines, it gets really hard. Like I could probably draw a slope field by hand. It's gonna be terrible. Um, there's no phase line that we can draw because there is dependence on both T and on Y. So we can't do a one dimensional drawing of this. The slope field would be a ton of work. That's not the direction that I wanna go. The other thing that I can see here clearly is that this is not separable. And it's obvious to me that this isn't separable because we have Y stuff involved with T stuff in two different terms. And the worst part is, is that they're like in flipped light, like locations, right? Y in the numerator versus Y in the denominator, and then the opposite for the T's. There's no way that you're going to factor out some T stuff because it's going to introduce additional T terms in one of the terms while removing it in the other, blah, 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 right? Where there's no way that we're going to be able to separate this thing. The final thing that I'm saying is that this is not linear, right? Is that there's, there's, there's a linear Y term here, but this is a rational Y term here. So we're not linear in Y. Um, and that's going to be an issue for us, right? So I'll at least say not linear in Y right here. So the bottom line is, the first thing I said right here is, here's the things that we can analyze. Separable, linear, and autonomous. This is not separable, not linear, not autonomous. So this seems to be uh, far enough away from what we know that we can't necessarily handle it. But as it goes with our U sub in, in Calc 2, we might think to ourselves, well, is there some change of variable that we could potentially perform some algebraic manipulation in a sense that we could perform that would turn this into one of these three things, separable or linear or autonomous, so that we could uh, get some way of analyzing the solution here? And so here's what I'm thinking again. I wouldn't expect for you to be able to come up with these steps on your own right here. This is just the doing example. In the future examples, we want to see how did I know to make those certain algebraic maneuvers, those certain substitutions. And so here's the thing that I'm seeing. Our first term is linear. And that's sort of saying to me like, dang, like we're close to being linear. If it weren't for that Y right there, we'd be linear, right? Another thing that I'm seeing is I feel pretty uncomfortable about y's in the numerator and y's in the denominator over here. And so kind of a thing that I'm thinking is, well, maybe we could just kind of, and I don't want to say solve any problem, but we can adjust our situation by saying, well, I this y right here is kind of frustrating for me because if it wasn't there, then we'd be linear in y. And I also kind of don't like the fact that we have y's in both a numerator and a denominator. That means to me that it's going to be awfully difficult for me to ever separate the y components you know separability maybe something like that so here's the algebra steps that i i think i could maybe go through right here um so 
uh, maybe we are going to multiply by y first. And the reason why, uh, that this seems like a good step to me is because it's at least going to get my, it's going to stop having like y numerator and y denominator stuff right there. At least it's going to get all of our y's up to being in the numerator. So if I multiply this whole dang expression by y, then I'm going to get y dy dt equals negative y squared over t plus t minus 1 over 2, right? So good things and bad things that this did for us. The good thing that this did for us is I at least don't have a denominator y partnered with numerator y anymore. The bad news for us is that we now have terms that are hanging out with our dy dt, that's kind of obnoxious, and we have a y squared over here. But now that I'm seeing that we have only one y squared term on the right, I'm now thinking to myself, well, maybe now if I could somehow make this y squared term just be like just a y, just a y to the single term power, then we would be linear in y at least on the right hand side. So again, the motivation for this is kind of uh, um, but I'm not worried about the motivation. I'm worried about the doing right now. Um, now it seems like maybe I could do a substitution. And I'll do it a u sub, just like we do in calculus, right? If we do the sub substitution u equals y squared, then that would turn my y squared into just a linear u term. But we also know that they, just like with u sub, that's not the only replacement that we'd need to make, right? We'd need to replace dy dt with some version of du dt. Well, what would that be? Well, du would be 2y dy. And ooh, that actually seems to be uh, a very useful uh, replacement expression for me here. Now, this is what we'd normally write when we're doing u sub right here, but I'm feeling like I don't want to have my differentials separated off. I'm not necessarily trying to do integration here. I actually want to replace a derivative term. I'm not looking to replace dy with an integral. I'm looking to replace dy dt with a differential equation expression term, right? So I'm actually thinking to myself, maybe we should just write this like where our u sub stuff actually comes from here, right? du dt, well, I'm taking the derivative with respect to t, so I should get 2y dy dt, right? That's for, for integration. That's the way that we write that stuff right there. That's not quite the format that I'm interested in seeing this. Instead, maybe we do our implicit differentiation with respect to t here, du dt equals 2y dy dt, and check out the really nice thing that happens. Not only is u going to replace y squared to make u be a linear term right there, but also our other issue is we had this extra multiple of y with dy dt. It's going to get perfectly handled here when we swap into du. Look how nice this is. So I'm just going to move that 2 over. And look at this nice set of substitutions that we get to make now. Now I get to rewrite this guy. y dy dt, that seems to be the same thing as 1 half du dt. On the right hand side, I'm going to get negative u over t plus t minus 1 over 2. And now just to get this back in a typical form, I'm going to multiply everything by 2 and write this ever so slightly differently. All right now multiplied by 2, so it's like a 2 over t uh, plus t minus 1. Now, if you've been uh, paying close attention in our videos, then what you will recognize is that you have seen exactly this differential equation before. This is exactly the very first uh, integrating factor example that we did in the last video. The literal only difference is that in the last video, u was y. We, we just did this problem. I'm going to redo it super quickly right here so that you guys can all watch me do another uh, integrating factor one right here. Um, but this is one that we've already seen before. So I'm going to go ahead and add this term over. I'm going to compute my integrating factor mu. multiply by my integrating factor. All 
I'm going to rewrite my product rule as the product rule. I'm going to integrate. And I'm going to divide by t squared. Now, we're technically not quite done in this case because if we were given a problem that was in terms of y, we better get back in terms of y. So the only thing now left that I have to do is rewrite this as y squared equals 1 fourth t squared minus 1 third t plus c over t squared. And we can take a square root. Right. So, uh, and by the way, I love that our book sets up some problems like this where they do such a good job of like kind of calling back to previous things that you'd seen um, in ways that aren't really repetitive, but that are like reinforcing. And I, and I really like that right there. So they, they basically just said, here's the example we started with in section 1.8, and they sneakily started section 1.9 with it, but in a way that you wouldn't ever really see it, right? That doesn't look really anything to me like what we were seeing before. Well, it does look kind of like it, but like not like I recognized it, you know. And so again, these these steps of like multiplying by y and doing that substitution of u equals y squared, I feel like those are kind of tough for us to see right there. I think the motivation for those is pretty poor. Um, but uh, you know, this this substitution setup right here that we did um, is something that you guys do recognize and are familiar with from Calc 2 right here. So one of the things that we want to get comfortable with today is just the fact that rather than doing our, our substitution with differentials, we're doing our substitution with full derivatives instead because we have full derivatives in our differential equations out there. So instead of like the du equals 2y dt, instead writing this as like the du dt equals 2y dy dt because u and y are both functions of t. And so their derivatives, uh, those are both implicit derivatives that we're getting right there. All right. Um, so a, a kind of a cool idea right here to take something that we can't handle and what we ended up turning this into is something that wasn't linear in y but we made a substitution and it became linear in u therefore giving us the ability to solve for u and then in our, as our last step we just undo the substitution that we previously did to get back in terms of our original variable so what we want to see though is like how would we know what substitution to make right that that's the worst part about this example is that this is a very unmotivated substitution the mechanics are there i don't think this is really anything mechanically new to us this is basically just a combination of section 5.5 from calc 2 with section 1.8 from differential equations right here we're just combining two old ideas that we already had so now what we want to look at is how, how do we how do we think to ourselves what motivate or what what substitutions that we should make right here so for our second example uh, we're seeing again another pretty gross equation right here I'm seeing things like it's not autonomous it's not linear and it doesn't seem to be separable I do see that I have like a ty term right there which makes me pretty strongly feel like we can't do any separation of variables right here um, so let me say again not autonomous separable or linear in y. Right. So again, it seems like it's like, what are we going to do with this? Now, the point though with this one is we want there to be a reason why we think that we know what substitution to make. I'm not just going to give you guys substitution. That's super lame. Then it's like there's no reason for us to even learn this technique if somebody else has to hand you the key to it, right? Um, so instead, what we're going to do is this. We're going to say to ourselves, well, listen, I can't solve it with separation of variables. I can't solve it uh, with an integrating factor because it's not linear. And I'm never going to go ahead and try and draw a slope field for this crazy thing by hand. It would take me a week. But fortunately for us, the year is 2021. Oh, God, that's a weird sentence to say. Fortunately, it's 2021. Um, but um, the good news is, despite everything else in the world, we at least have technology that's going to help us graph a slope field for us for this thing. So what we are going to do right now is we're going to go take a look at the slope field and we're going to say to ourselves, 
how does the slope field for this guy help us decide what type of uh, substitution might be most appropriate for us here? So let's pop over to our slope fields over here. I'm gonna wanna throw this equation into the slope field thing here. So I'm gonna pop over to our, our browser over here, All right? So here's the one I've been feeling this one at Bluffton has been working out really nice for me here. Um, I'm gonna change my variables to dy, dt. Oh, that's funny, you guys can't see the drop down menu. It's, it's kind of annoying. I'm gonna change this to dy, dt right there just so I've got t's and y's like we're looking at here. Um, and what's my equation here? I am looking at y squared. By the way, when I was testing this out, uh, yesterday, I was noticing that this thing does seem to care slightly about things like putting in uh, parentheses and product symbols here. So I'm going to do 4 times t times y. I'm not positive that it needs those asterisks there for multiplication, but I'm doing them. 4 times t squared. That might have been the thing that it was upset at me for, um, was the 4 times t squared when I was doing this before. Um, just to write this kind of out fully right here, you know, plus 8 times t minus 3 right there. So I'm going to hit enter and that is that the shape that I'm expecting to see right there. I don't think it is. Did I type that in wrong? dy dt is y squared minus 4ty. Okay. Hey, that's the shape I was anticipating. See right there? I had a little typo in there. So here's what I'm seeing. I'm just going to click a whole bunch of times in here as I do. Interesting. So here's the deal. What we're doing right now, every time we click, we're generating one particular solution, one particular solution associated with one initial condition. Since there's an infinite number of possible initial conditions, there's an infinite number of different curves that I could generate over there. What I'm recognizing is that most of them are these weird curvy shaped curves and I'm like, I have no idea what equation I'm getting for these guys up here. I have no idea what equation, these are. These seem to be like, sort of like our logistic curves, but notice that they're doing some like S shaped stuff. They're actually like changing direction here and swooping around. And then I got some more angly ones I don't recognize. But what I'm really asking you is, are any of the curves that seem like particular solutions here, do any of them seem like an equation that you recognize? And the answer is definitely yes. I don't recognize any of these curvy equations up here. I don't. I really don't recognize any of these S-shaped equations in here. I definitely don't recognize these curvy equations out here that seem to be comparable to these ones over here. But it seems like there are some solutions that are hard for me to click on exactly that are following some straight lines out here. And I know equations of straight lines. So what I think I wanna do here is, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit on this graph to see if I can just see a little bit more. I'm just gonna go from negative five to five and then make my y's like negative 10 to 10. And I'm gonna click a whole bunch more times. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, by making this h value a little bit smaller, it's gonna produce for us some slightly uh, cleaner curves out there, some slightly smoother curves. And so my question again to you is this, same question. Do you know the equation of any curve on this entire graph out of all these curves? And the answer is yes, you do. You know the equation of those two straight lines right there, or excuse me, you know straight line equations in general, right? So what I think I wanna do right now is I'm going to take a little snip of this guy because I want to throw this into our document here, so. Let me snip this. Kind of crazy looking graph, but again, what we're asking ourselves is we're just trying to find like something to cling on to right here. And the one thing I can see is it looks like there are two linear solutions to this differential equation. Um, that seems like something I can use to help me kind of get somewhere here. Um, and what I want to know is what are those two linear equations? So looking at this graph here, my question is, what are these two equations? I just want to come up with two equations of lines right here. And here's some stuff that I'm seeing. Um, and by the way, I feel like I could see this easier on, on other graphers that we have. Um, God, I just wish all I want is for there to be like a grid behind this thing, but I don't think it'll give me a grid. I just want there to be like the, like a subgrid behind it. And I don't see a way to add that in here. So instead I got to do some visual estimates. So let's check out this first one right here. This upper one, seems to be crossing the y-axis. So if you are looking 
uh, you can see over here or, or click on the graph right here it's going to give me the point that I'm hovering over it's going to be sitting right here so be watching right where my mouse is right now watch that as I hover when I hover over the y intercept point right here it seems like it's five right it looks like the y value of our y intercept there is five what's the slope of this graph where are we going to hit over here of that line it seems like if it hit that negative 2.5 here and at 5 right here then it must have a slope of 2 because it a 2.5 increase in X increased Y by 5 so I think that this upper equation right here is a slope of 2 with a Y intercept of 5 so like a 2t plus 5 it looks like these two are parallel to each other meaning the other one should also then have a slope of 2 and what's its Y intercept well, it looks like the y-intercept is negative 1 right there, and I can't get this exactly on there right there, you know, but that's our y-intercept looks to me to be very, very close to that negative 1. And by the way, if this thing does have a slope of 2, then we should be at 1 half over here because increasing by 1 half in x should increase y by, uh, y by 1. And I'm, I am seeing that one half is my x value right here. So here's what I'm seeing. Just by some sort of like visual estimates right here, it seems like these two linear solutions that we're seeing are y equals 2t plus 5 and y equals 2t minus 1. I'm just getting this by visual inspection from the graph. So let's pop back over into Microsoft Word over here where I've copied in uh, this graph that I clicked a million times on. Um, and so I'm going to say here, just just stop bringing that box up honestly Microsoft Word I'm never gonna click on that box that you bring up okay it looks like there are two linear solutions equals 2t it looks like that was the plus 5 one right there there's our height of 5 and that's our height of negative 1 so 2t plus 5 and y equals 2t minus 1 it seems like those are both going to be solutions to this differential equation I can see their lines in the slope field out there right and again I don't know there's like a like again a billion different curves that I could click on out here and I know none of their equations the only two equations I know that these curves follow are the two linear equations that seem to be separating this graph into three regions above between and below right so what I want to do is I want to use this to motivate a substitution so here's what I'm thinking to myself this seems almost like a really nice graph right this seems almost like something that would be like autonomous right like, like, like I could draw a clean slope field for if only these two skew lines were horizontal lines right where the equation is just a value being equal to a constant so here's what I'm noticing if I were to do a little bit of rewriting of these notice that if we can choose a substitution associated with this y minus 2t then that new substituted variable would be equal to a constant would give us a solution I choose this to be my u then we're gonna get two constant solutions a couple equilibrium solutions that would say if u becomes 5 it should stay at 5 for all time just like if you land on the line y equals 2 plus 
2t plus 5. You stay on the line y equals 2t plus 5 for all time. Well, we know that a special case of linear solutions is the horizontal solutions, where those are equilibrium solutions because the value is never changing, right? So we're currently in a situation where if you land on this line, right, if you start on this line, you stay on the line forever, either of them. But you're still changing, right? Over time, your y value does change right here. So these aren't equilibrium solutions. It seems like we would, if we make a substitution, we would just straight up get constant solutions of u equals 5 and u equals 1, which should be equilibrium solutions. If u becomes 5, it stays 5 forever. If u becomes negative 1, it stays u equals negative 1 forever. So this is how I'm motivating my substitution right here. Based on the graph, I identified two linear solutions, the only two equations I can come up with. By slightly modifying their equation, I can make a substitution that would give me constant solutions, equilibrium solutions, which sound to me like something that's a much easier thing for me to manage right here. So let's make the substitution. Of u equals y minus 2t. Now, I want to point out that there's lots of ways that we can like algebraically do this solution, do this uh, replacement right here. I'll just bring this down. Oh, come on, don't stop trying to center everything. Seriously, sometimes Microsoft Word, I hate you. Okay, I'm allowed to backspace. I swear I am. I swear you're going to get rid of these tabs. Clear all tabs all the time, over and over. There we go, we're back now. Okay, so I want to make this substitution of y minus 2t. There's a couple different ways that we could do this. One way that I could do this is I could kind of solve this equation for y. Um, so I want to do u equals y minus 2t. And let me do one thing before I talk about our multiple algebra routes right here. One thing I know is I need to get a replacement derivative term. And it seems like this is going to be my good way to do this right here. It seems like I'm going to get du dt plus 2 is equal to dy dt. So I've got a, a way that I can replace my left-hand side, dy dt. I'm going to replace it with du dt plus 2. I've got my replacement term to get the dy dt in terms of du dt. They differed by 2, and that's just based on that change in 2 that we see, a slope of 2. There's a difference in 2 with their rates of change. Um, now, how do we actually make the substitution happen on the right-hand side is a little less obvious. Yeah, what's up, Detox Mango? What's your question there? Either one's fine. Yeah. So one thing I could do Well, that is not something I'll be discussing in today's video here or anytime soon in this one, but uh, we'll, we'll be following along with, uh, with, our, with our textbook over the course of this semester here. So that's, I do not believe we'll be discussing the Risch algorithm at all this semester. In fact, I think that's typically a, a second semester topic in some classes. Um, so that will not be one of our current topics here, unfortunately. Um, so. I'm thinking, I'm trying to make this substitution right here, right? I need to, I need to kind of get my right-hand side as a big quadratic polynomial mess um, in terms of u relative to the y that we're in terms of right now. And one way I could do that is I could just do the, the, the forced algebraic substitution in there. Um, but one thing that we can see, if you are good with your quadratics here, that's a little bit nicer for us to see perhaps, is that this term right here... Um, is actually a perfect square of first three terms. Where y squared minus 4ty plus 4t squared minus 4y plus 8t minus 3 
Well, it seems like these guys, and I guess I should just give myself some more room right here. This is my DYDT. Right. So here's the thing I'm thinking I'm seeing. One, I know I'm going to replace DYDT with DUDT plus two. Over here, what I'm seeing is that those guys are actually a perfect square trinomial exactly. Y squared is, is y, y squared is Y squared. 4T squared is 2T squared. And Y times 2T times 2 is going to give us our middle term. It looks like we got a minus in there. So it looks like this is actually, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what do you know? That's actually Y minus 2T squared. And then even further, I'm noticing over here that it looks like if we factored out this negative four right here, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? So this happened to work out really nicely. I don't know that I can always expect something like that to work out that nicely, which is why I wanted to propose that option number one is always a, a guaranteed algebraic route to get there. But this one had some extra nice algebraic properties here. So here's the two steps I'm gonna do in my next line. I'm going to subtract two from both sides. So this minus three is gonna become a minus five. And y minus two t is exactly the u that we were looking for right there. And, oh my gosh, what is this gonna factor as? What is this gonna factor as? Oh, what do you know? It factors as u minus uh, let's see, plus five and u, wait a minute, right? Didn't I, am I off by a, oh no, yeah, that's a, wait. No, I'm just being dumb right here. I'm getting overly excited and then screwing up my, my factoring and quadratic right here. It's a negative four, so we do want the larger term to be the negative and that's gonna be a plus right there. Um, this guy has equilibrium solutions at u equals five and negative one, just like expected. Right. So we saw graphically that we were gonna have these two linear solutions. And we said, you know what? Linear solutions are awesome. And the only thing better than a linear solution that's skew is a linear solution that's horizontal because then they're straight up equilibrium solutions, right? That's a constant value. The value of that variable will never change. So the transformation that we really applied to this entire graph right here is we said, take things that follow this angle of, of patterning right here, this linear uh, direction, and undo the, the angularness of it, right? We, we, in a sense, stripped away the changing of y with respect to t. We changed variables so that, y, so that the u will not change over time. If you get to five, you stay at five. If you get to negative one, you stay at negative one. We know exactly what this slope field looks like, right? Um, so uh, let me just say right here, let's look at our graphs of each. Oh yeah. So TY, that's our graph that we've got up above right there. And it seems like what we now know is that there's going to be an equilibrium solution at u equals negative one and an equilibrium solution at u equals five. I can see just from knowing this quadratic, it's an opening up quadratic. So I know that between the two roots has gotta be where our rate of change is negative. So I know that I'm gonna get some downward sloping curves that are out here. I know that for my quadratic, these are all going to be above the axis out there and that these are all going to be below. Right. This is exactly related to exactly the graph that we just saw a second ago where we saw our, our solutions that went like this and this and where we did exactly this type of behavior. And these guys that were on the outside, right? These are, uh, you know, doing this, this behavior as they depart from here. All right. So what we did here is we took our uh, linear solutions 
and we made them horizontal linear solutions, which put us in a position where we can now much, much, much more easily analyze what's happening with this graph. We could even solve this U equation if we wanted to. We know that it's going to take a partial fraction decomposition to do this thing, but now we're separable. So technically we could solve this guy. And the bottom line is we just put ourselves in a situation where we went from having a very difficult differential equation to having a very simple autonomous differential equation. This is both autonomous and separable. And so again, what we've done is we've made a substitution that was graphically motivated to change ourselves from a differential equation that wasn't autonomous, separable, or linear into one that was both autonomous and separable, right? It's giving us much, much, much better analysis abilities by making that little change of variables that we did right there. And the way that we knew what change to make was by identifying the only two solutions out of the infinite number of particular solutions, <clears throat> two of them I knew how to talk about. And seeing that those two had a lot in common, that they were both slope two lines, I said to myself, wouldn't it be cool if they were both slope zero lines? And I just made that happen right there, right? And again, this kind of, I think that right here is the important part. All this stuff was just me doing some mechanical doing. This is algebra and like calculus one or calculus two. I care less about that. This was our thinking right here that we said, I can see these two lines. And I can see that if I were to write the lines in slightly different formats and make a substitution, u equals y minus 2t, that our motivation to do that substitution is because then u equals just a constant number would be a solution. That's an equilibrium solution when we get to our variable e being equal to a constant. And that's a highly desirable situation to be in. So this is our good sort of graphical motivation for how do we know what substitution to make is go look at your slope field and see if you can see any solution that you recognize. Maybe you're going to go look at your slope field and it's going to be a bunch of wild curves and one really nice parabola. And then you're going to say, hmm, I know the equation of that solution right there. I can get the equation of that parabola. Let's use that to motivate my substitution right there. So this is sort of saying in lots of slope fields out there, you're going to get in our general family of solutions, you're probably not going to recognize most of the curves. But if you can recognize just one, maybe you can say, well, what if I could take that one medium solution that I can at least handle, turn it into something that's a much simpler solution then maybe that will simplify our entire differential equation down for us right here, right? So this is to say, look at slope fields through a slightly different lens here to say, most of these curves you can't define, but if there's even one that you truly know the exact equation of that, uh, that particular solution, then that might be uh, a way that you can force your differential equation more generally into something that's easier for us to discuss and in the future then analyze, right? We can do our ana analysis of this differential equation, autonomous and separable. We can draw phase lines. We can draw slope fields by hand. We can solve it. We just got to do a little partial fraction decomposition because it's separable. Um, all that good stuff that's out there, right? And then put allegedly, if we could solve this, do the partial fraction decomposition, then we could undo our substitution and actually have an explicit solution for y, right? So this is an equation that we can solve for y now by doing the substitution, getting the solution for u, and then undoing our solution for u, uh, undoing the substitution, I should say, to get back into y land right there. So there we go. So another cool thing that we can do, and again, how do we know what motivation, how do we know what substitution to make? Motivating it in this case with uh, a graph, with a slope field drawn by a computer right there. So any one solution that you can identify in a slope field has value, even if there's an infinite number of them that you can't. Be, be able to identify at least one particular solution if you can, and that and that often take you to some place that might be uh, more helpful for you to be. So for our next example, what we want to see is other substitutions that we might make that might again say to ourselves, remember, autonomous, linear, separable. Those are the three things we can handle. It's the three things that we want. We also know that separable is kind of our easiest thing. Linear is maybe our second easiest thing. We'd like to come up with solutions when we can. If we can't, we at least want to get to be autonomous um, so that we could at least like draw a phase line or something like that, right? So let's go ahead and come back again to our mixing problem here um, to see a context of application going to motivate a um, a substitution that we might want to make here. In this case, this substitution is not necessary to do the problem, but I do think it makes it like a little bit easier. And it's at least giving us this kind of general perspective to say, well, think about what the quantities actually mean is going to be how we're going to know what substitution we want to make here. 
So let's talk about this problem here. It's going to be vaguely similar to our previous mixing problems here. We're at least going to deal with units in the same way. I know I've shaken my fist at you guys about units enough with these things. I think you've heard it enough. I'll probably do it one more time because I can't help myself. But that's okay. So back to our good friend, the mixing problem. A 10 gallon drum is now what we're dealing with here. It starts off with four gallons of, of, of clean water in it, right? Nothing in the water. At time zero, we're going to start doing three things. We're going to start adding this sugar at a quarter of a kilogram per minute. And I'm going to say, you know, as we have to do, one of our sort of hypotheses here is that everything's well mixed. Otherwise, we get a much, much more complicated uh, problem to deal with here. We're also going to be pouring in clean water at a rate of two gallons per minute. And we're going to open up a stopper at the bottom of the drum that's going to release one gallon of mixed water, right? Water with the sugar in it um, uh, per minute right there. What I want to know is this. What is the concentration, not the amount, the concentration of sugar in the water when the drum starts to overflow, right? You should notice that we're pouring in two gallons per minute, but we're only removing one gallon per minute. So it should be growing in volume until it gets to the top of the drum and then overflows out there, right? So our goal again is to say, what is the concentration of sugar in the tank when the drum begins to overflow? So we need to know when is the overflow going to happen and really kind of say to ourselves, like, what is this thing that we're solving for here, right? So I want to kind of define some things here to say, like, um, get back into our standard colors here. S of T is amount of sugar in the tank. Um... And it looks like we're going to talk about concentration. In the drum. And what this should be is this should be being measured in kilograms per gallon, right? And so that's our concentration of sugar. So it's a unit that would be associated with a C of T right there. So let's talk about when is this overflow going to happen? We can define some other variables like the volume of water in the tank. Keep on saying tank instead of drum, whatever. Same thing. So, well, what is this? Uh, well, what is the volume going to be over time? It starts at four. And then what happens? Adding this sugar, we're assuming that this sugar is dissolving in the water, not actually really taking up much more volume. This is sort of true. Um, you know, if you pour out a cup of sugar and then pour it into water and then well mix it, it's no longer taking up one cup's worth of space anymore for sure. Technically, it's probably making it increase in volume by a little bit, but, but not really much. We're assuming that to be negligible right here, right? So the point is, we're pouring in two gallons per minute. So our volume is getting bigger by two every unit of time, every minute. But it's also, we're also losing one gallon every minute, so minus one T. So it looks like our V of T equation, the volume of the of water in the tank at any given time is really the initial four plus every minute we're net gaining one gallon in the tank because two go in, one goes out, right? What we're interested in is when is this equal to 10? And it looks like time six after six minutes is when the overflow starts. Um, and our second question, what are we solving for? The concentration at time six Well, that should be the number of kilograms in the tank, number of kilograms of sugar in the tank. So that should be S of six divided by the number of gallons in the tank. Well, the second it starts to overflow, the number of gallons in the tank is going to be 10, right? And this should be basically our concentration at times six, right there might be my other way to say that right there, right? Concentration times six is the kilograms at times six divided by the volume at times six. And the volume at times six is going to be 10. So this is kind of helping us like orient ourselves with this problem here, right? We, we've identified a bunch of variables that we might be interested in using. We know what we're solving for, stuff like that. 
So what we want to do is build our differential equation for the amount of sugar in the tank. The reason why it's better to do our amount of sugar is because that's the units of stuff that we've been given is amounts of sugar that are going in. Um, I think that'll be an, an easier way for us to do this here. All right. So let's talk as usual with our, you know, our change in sugar is sugar in minus sugar out. That's a great way to define change here. So my question here is how do we define our sugar in and our sugar out and all we're going to do is follow our units as usual here um so our this is our should be measured in our kilograms per minute is our units of sugar and our units of time right here so what we know is that the sugar coming in is just associated with this we're adding 2.25 kilograms of sugar per minute that is in the units of kilograms per minute. That's already exactly what we want our units to be, right? So this is 0.25 kilograms per minute is what's coming in. <clears throat> Minus, we need to come up with an expression for the sugar that's going out. Now, what I know is that we are releasing one gallon of mixed water per minute, right? So I know that there's going to be this one gallon per minute term. But that's not good enough for me. All right, one gallon per one minute, I'll say right there. What I want is kilograms per minute. So I want the per minute to survive. I want the gallons to be swapped out for kilograms, right? So what I know is I know that this needs to be some expression of gallons and this needs to be some expression of kilograms. I am letting my units do all of the thinking for me in this case right here. So my question is, is there some conversion factor that I know for the kilograms per gallon that are leaving? Well, it seems to me like how many kilograms of sugar are in this tank right here? It should be the total amount of sugar in the tank divided by the total volume that's in the tank, right? So it seems to me like there are S kilograms of sugar in the tank, right? That's how many kilograms of sugar are in the tank at any given point in time. And how much, what's the volume of the tank right here of the stuff that we've got going out? Well, it seems like that's S out of four plus T gallons, right? That's our concentration right there, right? There's S kilograms of sugar divided by the four plus T gallons. That's our overall concentration. The rate at which it's flowing out is one gallon per minute. So that's our rate times concentration right here, right? And that's going to do us this job of our gallons and gallons are going to cancel. And that's going to leave us with a differential equation that's just in terms of S and T. This is where I'm going to drop my units so I can start just doing math. So here's our differential equation, right? Um, so I think that technically we can do this right here. Um, it seems to me like this is linear in S. We're going to take a little sideways adventure with this. Technically speaking, I think we could just straight up do the problem from here. But I do think that there's value, especially in application problems, to stop and say, like, are some of these quantities things that we could name as other things? Our goal is to find a concentration. sugar, not amount, and one of the terms in our dip -EQ is the concentration. So the thing that I'm noticing here is that our goal is to solve for the concentration at time six. One of the terms, all of this S over four plus T, that is literally the concentration of sugar in the tank. 
So this sort of motivates for me, again, the whole purpose of this is substitutions motivated by context of application. Since we're trying to solve for concentration and one of the, but we've built a differential equation in terms of amount, but one of the quantities in our amount differential equation is the concentration of sugar in the tank, maybe we should just make a change of variable for concentration to proceed with this problem. Right. This is my motivation for this guy right here. So this motivation doesn't come from math, right? This isn't something like, oh, I see a line that I know the equation of. That's a math motivation, right? This is a context motivation. S over 4 plus T, mathematically, doesn't mean squat to me. But when I interpret it in the terms of this problem, I know it to be the concentration of sugar in the tank. And we ultimately want to solve for a concentration of sugar in the tank. So it seems to me like this should motivate for us the substitution that says the concentration is S over 4 plus T. That seems to me like a substitution that we should make right here. I want to just rewrite my arrows so that this kind of makes visual sense right here. So if we do C equals S over 4 plus T, then it seems like we can go ahead and uh, you know try and make our substitution here. We need a DS DT term as well. So it seems to me like we want to, oh wait. Oh, I see, I see, I see what I did right here. Okay, I'm looking at my notes right here. So here's the thing I'm seeing. I want ds dt. So I want to just take the derivative of s with respect to t. The inconvenience for me right now is that this is not currently oriented in this direction right here. And I also want to make another note. And s is a function of t. And c is a function of t as well. So just remember that those are functions of t right there for our derivative purposes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply 4 plus t to the other side. And now I'll take my derivative with respect to t. Notice that this c is a function of t and 4 plus t is a function of t. So we've got to do a little product rule here. So I took the derivative of c. I'll leave 4 plus t alone. Plus, I'll leave the c alone. And I'll take the derivative of 4 plus t, which is just 1. And it seems to me like I now have an expression for ds dt that I can use to swap out. And let's see what this does for us here. So it seems like we're getting uh, oops, oops, oops. Right, so here's my substitution. ds dt became dc dt times 4. Oh, 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 oh. All right, all right. I'm going to get it right this time, I swear. I keep on dropping terms. Do you guys see what I'm doing right here? I keep on not... Oh, that's why I did it. It's because I didn't write it right there. All right, so there we go. Okay, okay, okay. So C, our concentration, is the amount of sugar divided by the volume, S over 4 plus T. So, and our ds dt, we did our little product rule right here to find ds dt is dc dt times 4 plus t plus c. Right. S over 4 plus t became c, and I finally included all the terms that are associated with ds dt over there, dc dt times 4 plus t plus c. So what am I going to do? Well, it looks like I need to subtract over the c, and I need to divide everything by 4 plus t. And notice the one nice little benefit to having done this. 
we started with a differential equation that was linear in s, so we could have used our integrating factor. Notice now we have a differential equation in c that is separable. So I think it's our slightly easier solving technique is separation of variables, and it's in terms of the actual expression that we want, or the a quantity that we want anyway, concentration. That was actually our goal to get at right here. So now, so let me just write a little comment here in blue. In terms of the quantity we actually care about. So we made this debatably easier. I don't know for sure if this is gonna be easier calculus to solve the separable versus the uh, linear, but it's at least it's in terms of the quantity that we already originally care about right here. So let's go ahead and solve this guy. Um, and let me just kind of block off my substitution here. That's my substitution work for that guy right there. Um, so let's take this guy and see if we can solve it here. It looks like I want to divide over the 0.25 minus 2c to the other side. Uh, looks like we're going to get natural logs on both sides. Get out of here. Extra stuff. Come on, man. So I'm going to get this as my natural log, but I know if I were to take the derivative, it would pop out a negative 2. So I need a negative 1 half to counteract that because we just took an integral. Equals the natural log of 4 plus t. Similarly, I know I get the natural log, but I know if I were to take the derivative, ah, it would only pop out a 1. So I'm good with this. I don't have any other constant multiple i got to deal with. And I'm going to do myself a favor, by the way. Um, and notice that c is actually a real variable here, not a constant of integration. So I'm using k. So um, what I know is I'm looking to solve this differential equation for C and just evaluate it, right? But what I also know is I have an initial condition for this thing. Initial condition to help me solve for K. I know that the concentration at time zero of sugar in the tank, well, what was the concentration of sugar in the tank when we first started? Well, at time zero, there was four gallons of clean water. So the concentration was zero at time zero, right? Let's go ahead and apply that. All right, so it looks like we gotta do a little bit of math right here. So I'm seeing natural log of, I know that this is like the one over the square root of 0.25, right? That's 0.25, but we're taking the negative one half power of it. So negative makes it one over, one half makes it the square root. Minus the natural log of four should be equal to K. And what are we gonna get here? We're gonna get the natural log of, so that's gonna be the square root of 0.25 is going to be 0.5, right? Because 0.5 squared is 0.25. That's gonna be the natural log of one half minus the natural log of four. That's gonna be the natural log of, uh... oh, okay, I got confused there for a second. I was like, this isn't what I remember. I dropped a negative right here, right, that negative. Oh no, I used the negative right there, Never mind.
Why am I confusing myself now with the answer that I have sitting right here? I have natural log of a half. This should be the natural log of one half divided by four, which is going to be the natural log of one over eight. That's not what I'm seeing that I am writing over here. I did talk myself into exactly, I, I like literally did this last night, and I was like, oh yeah, I got that one right. Negative one half, that should make that. Oh, 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 I think I see what I did right here. This is one over one half, that's what that is. That's one over one half, that's really, okay, okay, I'm on board now. I, I see what I did. So what I did right here is this should be one divided by one half. So that's what I've got right here now, not just one half. I just kept my denominator. So this should really be natural log of two over four. Which we can write as natural log of one half equals K. So I've got my constant of integration solved for based on my initial condition now. Now we just gotta go solve for C. Now we're just doing a bunch of natural log math here. Um, so one of the things I'm kind of seeing right away right here, I want to solve for C, so I'm basically just trying to expand this stuff over here. I also think there might be some benefit to combining these two terms right here. Um, so I'm going to do two steps right here. I'm going to do one, I'm going to multiply both sides by negative two. The other thing I'm going to do, I don't even think I need that parenthesis right here, is I'm going to combine these two natural logs right here. Since they're combined by addition, that means I get to do multiplication on the inside. So one half times four is two. One half times t is one half t. Right. Um, I can ex exponentiate now. 0.25 minus 2c equals e to the negative 2 ln 2 plus 1 half t. Um, I know that I can write this negative 2 as a power and let the e and the natural log cancel. So this should really just be 2 plus 1 half t to the negative 2 power, right? The negative 2 became the power on the quantity inside the natural log. e to the power of a natural log cancel, leaving us just with 2 to the 1 half t to the negative 2. And now I just got to subtract 0.25 and divide by negative 2, and we are good here. and divide everything by negative two. And so a quarter divided by two is an eighth and it'll become positive. So I'll write it out front. This will become negative and we're sticking the one half in front of it right there. So we've got our final equation here for C and then we can do our, so that's our general or our particular solution associated with our initial condition of no sugar being in the tank, so no concentration. And now we can just straight up solve for C of six, right? When I plug in six into this thing, six times a half is three, plus two is five. Five squared is 25, and the negative says do one over that. And if we go to our calculators and do this guy here, oh, I guess I know this one, it's 0.125 minus 0.02. And that's gonna give me 0 0.105 kilograms per gallon. That is my final concentration of sugar in the tank at the moment that the tank begins overflowing right there. All right, so, um,
you know, a bulk, a bulk of the work of this problem was us just doing the traditional solving techniques that we're doing, and that's good for us, right? So again, here, our, our motivation here, our motivation for this guy was to say, one of the quantities in our differential equation was the, actually the quantity of interest concentration. And by applying that substitution, it actually took us from being linear to being separable, which is an almost an even more straightforward um, route to the solution. Honestly, the only reason this was kind of a bummer is because we had a natural log equation equal to a natural log equation. So we had some work to do um, for solving right here. But like this was just a ton of algebra and this was just a ton of algebra. The calculus itself was pretty easy right there. Um, so we were able to arrive at our, at our final concentration right there. Concentration at time six when it overflows is going to be our 0 0.105 kilograms per gallon. Another thing that you could then note, note that you can interpret here is that the amount of sugar in the tank, well, if that's per one gallon, we know that the, ga the tank has 10 gallons in it. So it seems like I also know that there is exactly 1.05 uh, kilograms of sugar in the tank when it starts to overflow, one per gallon, and there's 10 gallons in there, right? So another motivation there, just recognize that if you're ever in an application problem, you want to stop and say to yourself, like, are any of these quantities in my differential ex equation actually some quantity that I like know what that actually means versus like up here, you know, like when we're looking at this guy, like, you know, if I'm looking at like these terms right there, for example, like, I don't know what the heck y squared minus 4ty is telling me right there. There was nothing like special about that. But when we were down here, this s over 4 plus t was a very special term. That was literally concentration. It was what we were wanting to talk about. So recognize that in application problems, sometimes you'll recognize a quantity to be something else. And sometimes, therefore, there's value in doing a change of variables to redefine your equation in terms of that uh, quantity that you recognize rather than remaining in maybe your your original simple setup right there, the way that it was easy to build the differential equation. Right? So a good question that you should now ask is, aside from just changing our ability to um, like do computation, why else do we care about this? I think that the real motivation for us caring about a change of variables is actually this concept of linearization. So what we're gonna do as our last thing for day, today is we're gonna look at just a quick thing right here. This will be like our, yeah, there's nothing else after that, right? Get, get down to our, our broad linearization strategy and why we care about it. And that's how we'll end today. The real reason we want to talk about linearization right now, though, is because this is going to be a very valuable technique for us once we talk about systems of differential equations. So I don't think it's until chapter four that this will come back around again, but we want to introduce an idea right now that's going to be kind of helpful right now, but is going to be very helpful later once we're in systems of differential equations. And the reason why is because it's going to be pretty hard for us to classify the types of equilibria that we see once we get into systems. What we're going to find is that even though we've seen in single differential equations right now, you're basically either a sink, a source, or a node if you're in equilibria. There's going to be many, many other optional classifications. We're going to get like 13 different classifications once we get to systems, which is why chapter three is a bit bulky. Um, and so it's going to get hard to classify, and it's also going to be more meaningful to classify. Um, and so this idea of linearization is going to give us an easier ability to do that classification to say, hey, can you classify that equilibria right there? So our, our basis for this concept right here is this. The easiest graphs to deal with in our lives are lines. That kind of was part of our original motivation, right? We said, let's take some lines because they're easy and turn them into even easier lines. Lines that had slope zero, as my second line says right here. Also, we know that the easiest number to do math with is zero. And so it is generally a broad goal in math. Anytime things get hard, we say, can we just think about those as lines instead? And we say things like, what if that number was just zero right there? Wouldn't that be an easy, easy bit of math for us to do? It's a very, very common strategy for analyzing like a huge variety of systems of, of, of did things in every branch of math out there. And this is certainly no different. So what we're gonna do is look at a little bit of an example right here that helps us like think in terms of those kind of ideas right here. So let's return to our limited growth population model. And let's, and, and today we'll pick some values for parameters, right? So this is this 0.06, this is the growth constant right here. That's that K that we normally see, that 500, that's our N, that's our carrying capacity, right? So we, we recognize this general format right there. We've just dealt with this very generally so far, rather than having particular numbers being in there. But uh, just pick some numbers for the, for the sake of our arguments here today, for the sake of uh, just having some extra discussion things. So what I want to know is this. When P is very, very small, what's this differential equation doing, right? If P is very, very small, or near
linear p equals 0, our 1 minus p over 500 is very close to just being 1, right? It seems like when our p value is very near to the equilibrium at p equals 0 that we can easily visually see right here without doing any math, p equals 0, p equals 500 to equilibrium right here. When we're near the equilibrium at 0, it seems like this whole second term here is just like 1. And so therefore, it seems like our differential equation near 0, near p equals 0, dp dt is sort of like just... 0.06p, right? Because it's sort of like it's being multiplied by a number that's super close to 1, given our other term that's right there, right? So we're coming up with an approximation. It's super important that I'm not writing an equal sign there. I'm writing an approximately equal sign. But the good thing that we've done by making this approximation is this is a wildly easy differential equation for me to state the behavior of the solution, right? I literally know what this solution looks like without actually doing the math, right? I know that this is just going to give me that solution of a e to the point 0.06t, right? So what that's kind of telling me now is things like I know that this is a growing solution, right? I know that this is going to have population growth at an exponential rate. That tells me it seems like this is going to be like a source. And the, what I did to do this is I said, listen, I don't want to like solve this differential equation or anything like that. I just want to recognize that very near to the equilibrium at zero, our differential equation is very near to this much, much simpler differential equation because one of our terms here, the 1 minus p over 500, if p is almost zero, then p over 500 is really almost zero. And 1 minus a number that's almost zero is about 1. Right, so we're multiplying by one. That's that's really trivial, right there. Right, it's basically saying that's very close to one. So we don't even need to consider that multiplication. The PDT equals 0.06p. That is just our basic descriptor of uh, exponential growth with a growth factor of 0.06, indicating to us that this p equals zero should be a source. Right, we're experiencing growth near p equals zero. Also, by the way, we've got our assumption here that p is not going to be negative. Right, so we're thinking positive p's that are near zero um, should be growing, uh, leading us to label p equals zero as a source. That's our classification of the equilibrium. So let's play the same game. We know that there's another equilibrium here that's near 500, right? Um, because if I started at that small one, I should grow until I'm almost 500. And what I want to know now is, well, what's the behavior of the differential equation like when p is very near to 500? Well, when it's very near to 500, the thing that I'm now thinking to myself is, 1 minus p over 500, so I guess I should say uh, near p equals 500, this is now close to 0. All right, it's really small. Um, but 0 0.06p is now large. Right? Uh, and kind of my bottom line here is multiplying by 1 is good because multiplying by 1 means nothing changes. Multiplying a number that's close to 0 by a number that's very big, it depends on how very big this is if we're going to be getting like small numbers, big numbers. Basically, this is tough to judge. It's tough to judge um, approximately 0 times a big number. I, I don't quite know what to do with this, right? In our previous situation, I said, oh, one of our terms is practically zero, so we, in a sense, ignore it because it was a multiplic... Or sorry, let me change. It's important here. What I said before is that one of our terms was very, very close to one, and since it was a multiplicative term, we could then, in a sense, ignore it. But multiplicative terms of, of actually zero would be a big deal. But it could still be that this is a small number times perhaps a massive number. Maybe we're going to get big stuff. Maybe we're going to get small stuff. It's just not as clear as it was when one of these was equal to one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 
Since we can't quite judge the combined influence of a number near zero times a number that's very big, what we should do is let's move this equilibrium near 500 to be near zero in the hopes that we can make some more generic statements like we made in our first setting right here that felt a little bit more comfortable, right? So the substitution that we're going to make is going to move the equilibrium at p equals 500 to instead be located at some other variable being equal to zero, right? Um, and so the substitution that I think would be reasonable then is to say we want to move the equilibrium at 500 to zero. How do you make the number 500 be the number zero? Well, you subtract 500 from it, right? So I'm thinking of the substitution u equals p minus 500. Notice that this is measuring distance from the equilibrium at 500. Right? However far you are. If we're at 490, then this is going to say that u is negative 10, right? And so that's going to give us things like uh, that we are only 10 away from that equilibrium that we're seeing right there, right? Um, so uh, it seems then like I could also get my du dt just as straight up equal to dp dt. And so it looks like this is a substitution that I can now make relative to my original differential equation. So let's see what happens uh, when I go ahead and do this here. So now I'm seeing that we're going to go from dp dt equals 0 0.06p times 1 minus p over 500. We're going to use the substitution u equals p minus 500. And du dt is just the same thing as dp dt. That's going to allow me to rewrite this as du dt equals 0 0.06 times, and it looks like what I need here is uh, p equals u plus 500. It looks like that's relevant here. So u plus 500 times 1 minus u plus 500 over 500. And I think there's some nice algebraic simplification that we can do here, so let's do that. Uh, what do we got right here? This is like 500 over 500 minus u plus 500 over 500. And so that seems to me to be 0 0.06 times u plus 500 times 500 minus 500. Well, this is just a negative u over 500 now. So now we're noticing that this equilibrium at u equals zero that we see from this term right here is exactly the one that we had a second ago at p equals 500. You should notice that this equilibrium at u equals negative 500 says you're 500 below your carrying capacity. That's our equilibrium at zero. So notice what we did right here. This p equals zero equilibria was easy for us to analyze up above. We ended up being able to essentially ignore one of the terms in our differential equation and get a simple classification of the, what we knew to be the correct classification of the equilibrium at zero. The equilibrium at 500, we were unable to perform that same technique. So we made a change of variables so that now we're analyzing u equals zero instead. So I'm gonna put a box around these two. These were our, are gonna be our two analysis situations. We just took one equilibrium was already at zero, so we analyzed it. The other one wasn't at zero, so we moved it to zero, and now we're gonna analyze it, right? This is saying we like equilibria solutions a lot, and even better than an equilibria solution is an equilibria solution at zero. So why don't we just move them all there every time we wanna analyze and classify? That seems like a pretty smart thing for us to do. Uh, so now when P is close to 500, U is close to zero. And by the way, I'm noticing a small typo right here. Um, if U is negative 10, then that says that we are at P equals 490, right? Just real quick right here. P is 490, we're 10 below. Oh, wait a minute, I think, wait, do I want to say? No, it doesn't matter, this is fine either way right here. It should be.
no, I guess I am saying if we're, if we're above this thing right here. So I'm going to say if u equals 10 right there, right? Um, so we're maybe like above our carrying capacity now. We've got 10 more than our carrying capacity right here. Then kind of what I'm seeing we're going to get right now is that we're going to get things like du dt equals 0 0.06 times. And what terms do we have over here? Wait a minute. Did I simplify this in some... Oh, I see the other simplification that I did right here. Okay, I want to do one more line of math with this guy right here. Let's multiply out these two terms right here. It seems like we should be getting du dt equals, and I'm going to write this as point zero. Okay, that's it. I need to give myself a little bit more room here to get this in a slightly more sensible form. Looks like we're going to get a negative u squared over 500 and 500 times this stuff is just going to give me a minus u so it seems like we're getting for du dt we are getting what well, we're getting negative 0.06 u minus 0.06 u squared over 500 okay now i'm in a format that i want to be able to plug in some some terms right here so now I'm going to get my negative 0 0.06. I'm going to just plug in like a 10 right here, right? As we said, minus 0 0.06 times 10 squared over 500. And the thing that I'm seeing here is I'm getting a negative 0.6 from this guy. But what am I getting over here? Well, this should be 100 over 500, so 1 fifth of 0.06. So it's going to be 0 0.012. And what I'm noticing here is that the contribution from the linear term is 50 times as large as the contribution from the quadratic term. So we know we're trying to analyze this guy near u equals zero, and what I'm seeing is that the closer and closer u gets to zero, the more and more the linear term of our transform differential equation becomes the dominant term, the only one that really is making a meaningful contribution, right? This 0.6 is 50 times larger than the 0 0.012. So it's really saying this is guiding us. This is this is leading the way for it. right here. This u squared term is hardly doing anything for us. So near u equals zero. du dt is approximately equal to negative 0.06 u, which has solutions of u equals a e to the negative 0.06 t, the decaying exponential, which says solutions near u equals 0, which is the same thing as p equals 500, should decay towards u equals 0, or p equals 500, which is going to finally allow us to conclude p equals 500 is a sink. So what we did right here is we said it can be difficult to classify uh, if an equilibrium is a sink source or node if that equilibrium is far away from zero. Right? Equilibria at zero are the easiest ones to analyze is kind of the bottom line right here. So what this says to us is that our general linearization strategy can be is 
to find the behavior of solute of, of solutions. Uh, oh my gosh, I can't talk. To find the behavior of solutions that are near an equilibrium solution. If I want to know, are they going towards it? Are they going away from it? In two dimensions, there's going to be lots more options other than that. So this is what's important is for the later part is that we're going to perform a change of variables that moves the equilibrium to the origin. And notice that this is just a shift. Always. We're always just shifting where we define the zero point of our graph. We're now saying, oh, we'll just consider P equals, zero, P equals 500 to be the zero point. We just define a new coordinate system where the equilibrium was at the origin. That was in the U coordinate system instead of the P. So it's just a shift. It's always a really easy change of variables. Even in two dimensions, we're just going to do two shifts, like an X shift and a Y shift to move any equilibrium out in space to be at the origin. Right? It looks like what we did in both cases is we said, oh, hey, those terms that weren't the linear terms, those don't matter uh, if you're near zero. What we saw in both cases was that they had very, very minimal contributions to the overall behavior of the differential equation compared to the linear term. The linear term is dominant near zero. Higher ordered terms are going to have trivial effects near zero out there. Right? Then we can go ahead and classify the equilibrium. So this is called linearization because we're saying, listen, just only uh, look locally at the linear behavior rather than look everywhere at all the behavior out there. If you zoom in really close near the equilibrium and only look at the linear terms of the differential equation, that will give you a good descriptor of what all the solutions are doing nearby. So this is very much like a pretty broad calculus strategy in general, which is to say, hey, you got a curve? Think about it locally as a line. Right? That's what the derivative is, right? The derivative has, says it's a curve, but if we zoom in far enough, any curve will look like a straight line if you zoom in far enough. That's the act of linearization. Every time you computed a tangent line in Calc 1, that's a linearization, right? And we know that those tangent lines are good approximations to those curves near to the point of tangency. And as soon as you get far away, your tangent line's a bad predictor of the behavior of that curve, right? We're just doing the graduated version of this right here. We're saying, let's look close near the equilibria and see what the straight line behavior seems like right there. That will be a good representative of the actual nearby behavior near that equilibria, allowing us to classify it. If we can see that they're heading towards, heading away, or all the other types of different things that can happen once we go into, into more uh, things out there, right? So sink source node is all we get in 1D, but once we go into 2D, we're going to have like more than 10 possible classifications that we're going to see. All those are going to be spread out throughout chapter three. And then in chapter four, we're going to come back to this linearization strategy and we're going to say, okay, sometimes these get hard to classify. When we see an equilibrium at the point 310, we want to do a U equals X minus three and a Y and a V equals y minus 10 we're going to shift it to the origin we're going to rewrite a new system in terms of u and v and it's going to be a piece of cake for us to classify it once we've moved it to the origin then we're going to say ah and that classification since it was just a trivial shift must also be the same classification as the unshifted equilibrium out there so this is just saying hard to do math with numbers that aren't zero easy to do math with numbers that are zero hard to analyze curves easy to analyze lines so we take our curves and our behaviors that are far from the origin, we move them to the origin, and we only picture their local linear behavior, and it's gonna be representative of the true behavior there. We're gonna see a small number of cases in which we can't trust our linearization, and we just wanna identify when to be a little bit weary of that, but that's gonna, it's in general, is gonna work out pretty dang nice for us in most cases right here. So this linearization strategy, this exists in like many, many branches of math do like this exact broad strategy, not like this exact mechanics of this one, but like, the strategy generally of linearization exists in lots of places. Our more important application of this isn't gonna to be till later in chapter four, but this absolutely belongs in our first section here on our substitutions for today, because every linearization strategy starts with saying, move to the origin. And that origin is always gonna be a substitution doing a graphical shift for us right there. So that's why it belongs in this section. But I think our more meaningful applications of this are gonna come a little bit later this semester once we're in two dimensions. So I know I went a smidge longer than I always try to go here today. So I'm going to try and wrap this guy up right now. Um, we just finished chapter one. We're going to start talking about systems with chapter two next week. We're going to get two, one, and two, two next week. 
The week after that, we'll get two, three, and we'll, and then two, four will be the start of our uh, numerical unit. When I say two, four, it'll really actually be that we're going to do one, four, and then the two, four, and some chapter seven stuff will come three weeks from now out there. But that's coming up right now. So keep making sure that you, you know, if you haven't gotten into Python, you should email me by now. I'm kind of assuming that everybody has. I know that you guys filled out your little questionnaire in Canvas right there. So. That's all I got for you here today. We covered 1.8 and 1.9 this semester, or this, this week right here. Oh, semester, we've got to do more than that. Uh, and I will see you guys to start our system stuff next week. Come hit me up in office hours if you guys have questions. Otherwise, I'll see you in our next video. Have a good